Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are answering your questions on the topic, Zakat. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakia. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, we've got a huge number of questions on this topic, probably more on this topic than any other that I've ever seen. So, let me grab the trusty clipboard and get stuck in. Dr. Zakir, the first question we have from one of the viewers is, bear with me because quite a few of these are quite technical and I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you know all about them anyway. But some people claim that zakat on wealth, if above nisab, has to be paid only once in a lifetime. If you have paid zakat on a particular wealth or gold, you don't have to pay it again next year. Is there a difference of opinion in this matter? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmain, amma abad, awuz billahi min shaytani rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, rabbi shahli sadri, wa yisirli amri, wa ahlul uqdat min lisani yafqahu kawli. As far as regarding the question, is there a difference of opinion? as far as zakat should be paid once in a lifetime or should be paid every year. In the past 1,400 years, right from the time of the Sahabas till the Salaf Salihin, till late, never has there been any scholar, any fuqaha who has ever said that zakat should be paid only once in a lifetime. You read the Quran, you read the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, never will you find any Hadith, any Quranic verse, any scholar that has ever said that zakat should be paid only once. There's no difference of opinion whatsoever. Lately, just a few years back, this issue has come to the picture. And I was there in Chennai a few years back. And the same question was asked to me. This originated from Chennai, that's South India. This question was asked, and there was a local person who had raised this issue. And there is ample of evidence from the hadith that zakat should be paid every year. And there's no question of difference of opinion, and I don't know how this controversy came up. If you read the hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's mentioned in Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number two, Book of Zakat, hadith number 1568. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you have 200 dirhams, and if you possess it for a period of one year, then you have to pay five dirhams. That means two and a half percent, one fortieth of it. And there is no zakat on gold if you have less than 20 dinars. Now here it says that you have to pay zakat if you possess it for one full complete year. There is no mention that you have to give once in a lifetime. It indicates that if you possess for two years, you have to pay twice. If you possess for three years, you have to pay thrice. It's understood. If anyone says that it has to be given once in a lifetime, there should be proof in the Quran on the hadith which states clearly. And there are various other hadith which clarify this issue. If you read the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, book of Zakat, hadith number 1577, the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that anyone who has three signs has seen belief, the one who worships only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who says there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one who pays zakat on his property agreeably every year. So here the statement is clearly mentioned every year. That means zakat should be paid every year. So there is no difference of opinion at all. And it's authentic hadith. And furthermore, there are various references that can be given that can easily disprove this point, that it should be paid only once in a lifetime. The hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, one number two, in the book of zakat, Hadith number 1402. You know, some people argue that, you know, zakat need not be paid on livestock and etc., etc. This hadith of Sayyid Bukhari or number 2 in the book of zakat, hadith number 1402, it says that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the animals of the livestock, the camels, they will appear on the day of resurrection 
in the healthiest form that they have been in the world. And will go to the master, to the owner, and if he has not paid zakat, they will tread them under their feet. And the hadith continues, that the sheep, they will appear in the healthiest form that they've been on this earth. And if the owner has not paid zakat, they will butt them with their horn and will trample them beneath the hoof, indicating that zakat should be given on these animals. Further, if you read the hadith of Hadith Abu Bakr, may Allah be with him, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari or Ibn Bachu in the book of Zakat, hadith number 1399 and hadith number 1400. There were some Arabs who did not want to give Zakat and they revolted. So Hadith Abu Bakr, may Allah be him, he said that he will wage a war against these people. Hazrat Umar him, said that, but the Messenger of Allah said that those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't worship anyone else and those who say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we should not wage a war against them. So Hazrat Abu Bakr him, said that anyone who breaks the law, he'll wage a war against them. And anyone who differentiates between Salah and Zakat, that both are complicity, he'll wage a war against them. And by Allah, he says, that anyone who used to give a she kid or a lamb at the time of the Prophet and now is reluctant to give or does not give that zakat which used to get the time of the Prophet, he will wage a war against them. Indicating that though zakat was given last year, this year too it had to be given and if they did not give, Hazrat Abu Bakr may Allah with him, he would wage a war against them. And Hazrat Umar may Allah with him says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had opened the heart of Hazrat Abu Bakr and what he said was right. Indicating that zakat has to be given every year. Furthermore, the various hadith how zakat used to be collected. And there's a hadith if mentioned in Sahih Bukhari in the book of zakat. Hadith number 1454 where a person says that he was appointed by Hazrat Abu Bakr him, to collect zakat. And he said that the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said how zakat should be collected. And he goes on saying that if it's a camel, if the number is five, then you have to give one sheep as zakat. And the number keeps on increasing and the zakat keeps on increasing. If it's 40 sheep, if anyone has a flock of 40 sheep, you should give one sheep as zakat. Anywhere between the number of 40 to 120, the zakat is one sheep. If the number of sheep are between 120 and 200, two sheep have to be given for zakat. If it is between 200 and 300, three sheep have to be given. And for every hundred extra, one sheep has to be given. Now, when the collector of zakat went to collect the zakat, they used to count the livestock. They used to count the head of the cattle. They now looked for how many new cattle have you got? How many new were born? They counted all the cattle available there. That means they even took zakat on the cattle that were paid earlier. They didn't say, okay, this already last year you gave, so I'll not count that. Please give me the number that you have purchased lately, or the new kids that have been born, or they should look out for any goat or any sheep which is less than one year old. That wasn't the case. So this clearly proves that zakat has to be given every year, and it should be given as long as you possess the wealth for a period of one year, and if the nisab is above the level, then you should pay every year. And this idea that it should be given once in a lifetime is a new idea, which I've never heard before. It just came a few years back. It's unheard of in the past 1400 years. So there's no difference of opinion whatsoever. Whichever group of Fokaha, whatever they are, all of them agree that zakat should be paid every year. That clears that up. Alhamdulillah. Question two. Is it essential to inform the person that he is being given from zakat. It's not compulsory that you should inform the person who you are giving zakat that they are from zakat money. As long as you are sure that the person who you are giving to comes under one of the eight categories mentioned in the Quran, Fukara, Masakin, and all the categories which we discussed last time, if he falls under one of these categories, it's not compulsory that you have to mention it's from zakat. If there is a doubt, that he may not fall in the category and then making inquiry is a must. 
But otherwise, in a general case, it's not compulsory. You have to mention that this money is from zakat. Question number three. How should zakat be paid on land? Is it sufficient to pay zakat on it once for a number of years when it is sold? If any land is purchased for the purpose of selling, for doing business, then zakat should be paid 2.5% of the value of the land every year. So once you possess the land and if one year passes, then you have to pay 2.5% of the current value. So whichever date you have chosen to calculate zakat, it should not be on the price at which you purchased. The price may go up off land, the price may go down. So whatever is the present value of the land that you possess, the moment one year is completed after you have acquired it, you have to pay zakat 2.5% on it. And suppose you have a land for several years and you have to pay every year from whatever other wealth you have. But if you don't have any other wealth and it's only land that you have and you're unable to pay the zakat, paying every year is the best. But if you're unable to pay if you don't possess any other wealth, that time as a last resort, which is not recommended, but as a last resort if you don't have any money, then you can delay the paying of zakat till the time you sell it. And when you sell it, if you possess the land for five years and you haven't paid zakat, so when you sell it, you have to pay five into 2.5. But you have to note down the value of the land every year. The first year the value may be X, second year it may be Y, third year it may be Z. So note down the value every year and if you 2.5% of that value that year, and you have to add up 2.5% each year, add up the five years, and then that amount you have to give after you sell the land. But the best is to give it as soon as possible. Thank you, Dr. Zakia. So, brothers and sisters, inshallah, see you soon after a short break. Yeah. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan Day with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we're discussing your questions on the topic, zakah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The next question, question number four. Some people invest in real estate because they don't want to invest in banks. But they claim that the zakat on such wealth has to be paid only on its rent and not on its original value. What is your observation on this issue? As far as the view of the majority of the scholars is concerned, what they say, that if the land has been purchased for selling, so that you make a profit, then all the scholars unanimously agree that zakat should be paid on it. As we discussed in the last answer, that the moment one year is completed, the land that you purchase, zakat has to be paid on it. But if you have land, and if you give it on rent, means if you buy a house and give it on rent, majority of the scholars say that zakat is not applicable on the value of the house. Zakat is only applicable on the rent you receive. The moment you receive the rent, and if it stays with you for a period of one year, and if it's above the nisab level, then you have to pay zakat on the rent, not on the value of the house, the flat, or the land. But nowadays, most of the people that purchase land for investment they give it on rent. So here we are in a dilemma that people who purchase land, mainly the purpose of investment, but if they think that they'll buy the land, they sell after four or five years when the price rises. So but natural, they don't want to keep it vacant. So they give it on rent to a person who requires to stay in that flat. Now what will happen? Should we pay zakat or not? So here there's a difference of opinion. And here scholars differ. Some scholars say that fine, pay only zakat on the rent if you possess it for more than one year, if it's above Nisab level. And when you sell it, on that year only you pay the 2.5% of the total value of the land. But there are some scholars who are very strict and who disagree with this view. And they say that if you buy a land, even if you give it on rent, the cost of the land, the market value of that land or of that flat should be paid every Hijri year. Scholars like Ibn Aqil, they say this. Ibn al-Arabi, Ibn Aqil, who's a humbly, 
ابن العربي هو از ملكي شيخ ابو زورا هو زحنفي عبد الرحمن الحسن شيخ عبد الوهاب خلف هو از بريزنتلي ا فيري بيت سكولر شيخ مصطفى القرداوي and scholars of the same group they say that if a person buys and has many flats on rent then he should even pay zakat on the cost of that flat of that land but for example if a person is a poor person and doesn't have any income doesn't have any business and he has only one house which he's living and a second house which he gives on rent so unanimously people agree that the rent he acquires if it's saving is more than the sub level but there are many rich people who are landlords and who possess many houses many flats with the given rent they own large properties and if we agree with the view of the majority of the scholars that zakat should be only paid on the rent suppose a person has 100 flats costing hundreds of thousands of dollars and the rent that he gets he utilizes what is required for his personal expenses and before one year is over after he gets the rent he buys another few flats so and if he doesn't have any gold jewelry that means he will not pay zakat at all after the 100 flats become 110 120 140 maybe he is one of the richest man in the city of bombay or any city he may own half the property of the city half the land in the city so if you agree that zakat should not be paid he may be a multi billionaire may own half the city may own three fourth of the city he takes rent when he gets the rent before it becomes one year he utilizes what he wants then he buys new land and if zakat is not there on land which is given on rent he will keep on getting richer and richer and richer without paying a single dollar as zakat so therefore i agree more with the minority group of scholars like ibn al arabi ibn aqil sheikh abu zohra sheikh yusuf al qardawi and the likes of these scholars who say that if a person possesses a large amount of land and many houses giving on rent then zakat should be even paid on the cost price of the land of the flat whatever is the present value of that land or of that house he has to pay 2.5% zakat every hijri year i am agree more with these type of scholars and anyway even if it is not required a person pays extra allah not question you surely you will get sawab for that even if you give a sadqa you will get sawab so I always agree when in doubt leave it out and go on the side which will give more sawab because minimum is 2.5% zakat if you pay more allah will yet be happy sounds reasonable to me Question 5 There are many rich Muslims who build huge houses more than they require There is no zakat on a house in which a person lives If these houses were smaller the money saved would be liable for zakat but because they build huge houses they get exempted from zakat Kindly comment Again in this issue too there is the same difference of opinion normal ruling is that what is the basic necessity the shelter the house which will require protection from the prying eyes protection from heat cold rain it is the basic necessity and the house in which you live is not liable for zakat there is no difference of opinion but in such case as the questioner has asked that he has a mansion a person who may be having a wife and three four children may require two rooms three rooms five rooms six rooms how many but if he has a mansion which may be equivalent to 10 houses then should he pay zakat or not so again most of the scholars they say that the house in which you live is not liable for zakat but it will fall under the category of israf as allah says in the quran in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 26 and 27 that be not a spendthrift be not extravagant for verily a person who is a spendthrift is brother of the devil Allah says in Surah Furqan chapter number 25 verse number 67 that these are the believers who are neither miser and niggardly neither the extravagant they follow a middle path so extravagance is haram in Islam 
So having such mansions is totally prohibited. People will say it's haram, people will say it's makhru, whatever it is. But yet, because they're living in it, most of the scholars say zakat need not be paid. But again, the same group of scholars, Ibn Aqil, Ibn al-Arabi, Sheikh Abu Zohra, Sheikh Abdul Waf Khalaf, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman Al-Hassan, Sheikh Yutur Al-Kardawi, these group of scholars, they say that if a person has a mansion, which is much more than what the basic requirements, multiple times more, then it's an excess wealth. And I agree with the questioner that you could have bought 10 houses and lived in one, so on nine houses there have been zakat. Since it's excessively rich, these group of scholars say that zakat should be paid even on that house. A person who owns many houses also, he should pay zakat on this, and I agree with that view. And even if it's not liable, the person is so rich. So even if you give 2.5%, it will be better for him. It will be a protection for him on the day of judgment. So I'm of the view that these people should pay zakat on the house. Thank you very much, Dr. Zaki. Next question from another viewer. Some Muslims are extremely rich and have several huge companies and factories and such like. Should zakat be paid on complete assets that the person owns or only on its goods that it's acquired? Again, the same different opinion. The normal ruling is that you pay zakat on the merchandise and goods of trade, what you buy and sell. But the place where your business is, it's free from zakat. You may have vehicle which you use for transportation that's free from zakat. But only on the goods and merchandise you pay zakat. But this example is again of a very rich Muslim who has many companies, many factories, maybe costing millions of dollars. Should he pay zakat only on the goods or on the full assets? Again, the same group of scholars say that since he's excessively rich and the company is very big, and normally what rich people do, that they have one company, whatever profit they get, no one stores it in the house. He won't keep it in the lock and key. He won't buy gold and keep it. He'll buy one more factory. That's an investment. So a person who has few factories, who makes millions of dollars a month, the moment he gets it, within a few months, he invests, he opens one more factory. Then he earns more, he opens one more factory. So if he has to pay only on the goods, the goods per se, the stock will be a very small amount. But the cost of the factory will run into hundreds of millions of dollars. So I agree again with the same group of scholars who say that if a person owns many factories, so the zakat should be paid on the complete asset of the factory, including the land. A beloved Prophet Muhammad further said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 5672, the Prophet said, that a person will be rewarded for everything that he spends, except what he spends in making buildings, and you know, also making buildings and all these big things. And further it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, Hadith number 3185, the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that I am not worried about my ummah as far as poverty is concerned, but I am more worried about my ummah as far as prosperity is concerned because previously many people were destroyed because of luxury and they used to compete with one another. So I am worried about my ummah because of luxury and they will compete with one another and as the early people were destroyed, they too will be destroyed. So Muhammad was worried about these things, about luxury, you know, having big, big mansions, having big, big factories. And just to get on common terms, when the question is asked, that when you buy shares, you know, stock market, halal stock, halal shares, of a company which is halal, and you ask any scholar that you buy the share, do you have to pay the car? They'll say yes. Whatever the value of the share, NAV, net asset value, you have to pay zakat on it. So when you buy shares of the company, the share cost is equivalent to the complete asset. It is not only on the goods. So when you buy share from the stock market of a company, and then you're paying the full zakat of the share value, if a person owns a company completely, that means he's 100% shareholder. 
So there, when you buy 1%, 2% of the shares, you're paying complete amount on that 1%. That includes the land cost, everything. So here, why, when you own it completely, you only need to pay on the goods. So here, agreed, it becomes the difference. So in share, you have to pay on the net asset value. I believe in the company, you have to pay for the complete net asset value. And inshallah, that will increase the wealth of that rich man and will purify his wealth, inshallah. So the best thing is that, and Allah says in Surah Tawbah chapter 9, verse number 34-35, that hoard not gold and silver. There are people who hoard gold and silver and spend it not in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give not zakat on it. Announce to them a grievous penalty where heat will be produced from the fire of hell, from the wealth they possess, and they'll be branded with it on the head, on the flanks and the back, and be told to them that tasty the wealth which you hoarded. So therefore I'm of the opinion that zakat should be given even if it's a big mansion, even though you're living in it, give zakat. If you have multiple houses, give zakat. If you own land, even given on rent, give zakat on it. If you own factories, give zakat. As a general rule, if the person is really very rich, really very rich, he should give zakat on everything. I know that the basic nation did not be given zakat, but it's safe for the akhara that he gives zakat on the position of the factory and everything so that it is safe and is free from the fire of hell. Thank you, Dr. Zakir, for that. So, brothers and sisters, inshallah, see you soon after a short break. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan Day with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we're discussing your questions on the topic, zakah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A sister does not have any wealth apart from jewelry. Should she sell some of it in order to pay the zakat on it? As far as the jewelry she has, if it's gold, and if it is above the nisab level, 85 grams of gold or above it, then zakat is compulsory. If it's silver, it should be 595 grams of silver or above it. If it's more than the nisab level, zakat is compulsory on it. Zakat can be paid even from other wealth that she has or from the jewelry itself. If she has other wealth and she pays zakat, every year she has to pay 2.5% of the value of the gold or silver. If she doesn't have, any of her relative also can pay on her behalf. Whether it be father, mother, brother, no problem, they can pay. But if she doesn't have any wealth and no relatives, then she will have to sell part of her jewelry. She'll have to sell 2.5% of that jewelry and give zakat. It's compulsory, should be given every year. Okay, thank you. The next question is, if every year 2.5% zakat on savings or jewelry is given, is paid, after 40 years, there would be nothing remaining. Is this a trick question? <laughs> Many people think that if we keep on giving 2.5% zakat, so 2.5 multiplied by 40 becomes 100%, so you give 2.5% every year, then at the end of 40 years, you'll be left with nothing. Actually, the match is a bit weak, because zakat is given on what they have for one full year. So if, for example, someone has maybe 100 grams of gold, so he has to pay zakat for the first year 2.5%. That is two and a half grams of gold. Next year, he has to pay two and a half percent on 97 and a half grams, not on 100 grams. So, which will be less than two and a half grams gold. So, it will take much more than 20 years. And the full asset can never be nil. It can never be. Even if hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, but it will never be nil. It will keep on diminishing. Something will be left. But again, the moment it reaches a nisab level, just after a few years, if the lady gets two and a half percent, maybe about for a few years, maybe five years, ten years, fifteen years, within a few years, from five to ten years, it will reach a nisab level. The moment it goes below 85 grams of gold, which will take somewhere close to about ten years odd, or a little bit more, moment it reaches below nisab level, then you stop paying the car. Or if a person has a thousand grams of gold, 
He keeps on giving. But the moment reaches Nisab, they stop giving gold. So never can it be zero. Even practically, if they keep on giving, even below Nisab, it will not reach zero. But the moment it reaches Nisab according to Islamic Sharia, they don't have to give zakat. So that's the reason, alhamdulillah, this tax is levied every lunar year. Jazakallah for the answer. Next question. Are diamonds exempted from zakat? As far as diamonds and other precious stones are concerned, ruby, pearl, sapphire, the unanimous agreement amongst all the scholars that zakat need not be given on these precious stones, including diamonds. But if it is used for trade, for buying and selling, then but natural, it should be paid once every year, whatever stock you have, if you are using it for selling. But if it is used as an ornament, you know, the precious stone, zakat, is not liable. But if there's a mixture of jewelry, gold and diamond together, then if that amount of gold reaches the nisab level, then zakat is due on that. But on the diamond, on the other precious stones, it's not liable. But again, nowadays, many people, they purchase diamond as an investment. You know, because even the value of diamond increases. So if it's bought with the niya of investment, there are certain fukahas who say that, if it's for investment, the niyat is there, if the intention is for that, and to gain profit, then zakat should be paid on diamond. But if it's only for normal use, for personal use, and not for investment, then zakat is not liable on diamond than other precious stones. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Dr. Zakir, for that. The next question we have from yet another viewer. How should zakat be paid on commercial goods? Should it be based on the price for which it was bought, or the price for which they are to be sold. As far as a person who buys any article for his use, then but natural whatever he buys, whatever the cost is, you have to take out the depreciation and pay zakat on that amount, depending on what it is. If it's land, it may appreciate, it may go down. If it's a machinery, then depreciation. But this question is mainly for goods for trade. That a person who buys some goods for selling, so should he pay at the price at which he bought it or at the price at which he's going to sell? Here again the scholars differ. According to Sheikh Saleh Munajid, he says that if you buy certain goods for selling, if you're a wholesaler, then take zakat on the price of wholesale that are going to sell. If you're a retailer, then you take out zakat on the price at which you're going to sell on retail. And if you're doing both, then take a rough estimate and then take out zakat. But some of the scholars, they say that in retail, the profit margin is quite a lot, depending upon the good you're dealing in. If you're dealing with maybe buying and selling books, the profit margin in books is 40%, 50%, 60% also. So imagine if someone has large shop of books or a chain of bookstores and if he purchases worth maybe hundred thousand dollars worth of books when he sells the selling price may be more than two hundred thousand dollars so for him to pay zakat on the selling price would be too much so i agree more with those scholars who say that whatever is the cost once you buy it since it's with you you haven't made the profit yet so the cost price for you for that book is the cost at which you bought it, at the discounted cost. So if you're getting 50% discount, so whatever you bought it, that you pay zakat. When you sell it, then you get the 50% profit. Or maybe many a time, the books aren't sold. So you have to keep a sale, and then sell the book at 40% discount. Sometime you have to sell it at a loss. You purchase 50% discount, but sell it at 60% discount. And especially you take out the books which are there lying with you for maybe five years or six years or eight years. So imagine you pay eight years zakat on the higher side and then you sell it at a discounted rate. So I agree more with those group of scholars who say that you pay zakat on what you actually paid. And then if the cost price increases, for example, you buy a good of $100 or 100 rupees and you get 50% discount. So your buying capacity is 50 rupees or $50. 
Suppose the price, the MRP, the maximum retail price increases to 110 rupees, 110 dollars. Then you calculate 50% discount, 55 rupees. That time you can increase the price, but not at the selling price. You don't know whether you're going to sell at the full price or discounted price or whatever it is. Therefore, I agree more with what is the cost, what discount you get, add it to the present cost. And that's how you have to make out what is the total value of your goods after possible one year and then pays a card to a half percent on it. Okay, great. Thank you. Next question. Is there any zakat on rental cars and vehicles that companies own for moving produce? As far as possessing vehicles which are given on rent, the same view is used as houses on rent. And the same thing. So majority of the scholars say that if it's vehicle given on rent, no zakat is there on that vehicle. Fine, if it's a taxi driver who is a poor person, who has one taxi, and his earning is just a few hundred dollars a month or a few thousand rupees a month. But natural, if he pays zakat on the cost of the vehicle, on the taxi, it will be too much for him. So I agree that there should be no zakat on the cost of the vehicle. But on the other hand, if you have a person who owns a fleet of cars, maybe a thousand cars, you know, we have Hertz and this big, big company who own thousands of cars. Now for them, that itself becomes an asset. You know, if they give on rent, they can keep on buying every few months hundreds and thousands of cars. So I believe that if it's a fleet of cars, and if it is given on rent, then the cost price, the depreciated cost price, don't take the cost at which you bought the car, but take the depreciated cost, every year keep on taking on depreciation, but give it at that value, you give 2.5% zakat, that will be preferable. I agree more with those same group of scholars, Sheikh Kardavi, Ibn Akil, Ibn Al Arabi, Sheikh Abu Zohra, Abdul Rahman, Al Hassan, and all these group of scholars. So, brothers and sisters, inshallah, see you soon after a short break. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the show, Ramadan Day with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chabers, and today we're discussing your questions on the topic, zakah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Next question. Another viewer, there are many Muslims who haven't paid zakat for years. Now, if they choose to repent, do they have to pay the zakat for previous years? If yes, then how do they calculate the zakat since they haven't got a ready record for the number of years and the amounts, etc., and the details? As we discussed a few days earlier, Ramadan, the month of repentance, there are some criteria for repentance. If you have done something wrong, agree it is wrong, stop it immediately, don't do it in future, and if you can undo it. So if you know not paying the cut is wrong, agree it is wrong, not paying the cut, stop it, that means stop not paying the cut, that means start paying the cut. See to it in future, you don't stop paying the cut, keep on continuing paying the cut, and you can undo it. Undo it means you have to pay the cut because that belongs to the poor people the eight categories of people. So you're depriving them of their wealth, which is rightfully theirs. So if you have not paid zakat for a few years, and now you have realized that you have to pay zakat, so you have to roughly calculate what was the amount of zakat you had to pay each year. So if you haven't paid for five years, roughly calculate. If you can exactly, if you know what was the saving and what was the asset, then calculate exactly. If you cannot, then whatever to the best of your ability, so that the conscience is clear, go back with that five years, 10 years, 15 years, Pay two and a half percent of the each year what asset you had, what savings you had, and give it as soon as possible. The sooner you do it, the better it is. That is the best way of repenting, and inshallah, Allah will increase your wealth. Jazakallah khair. Dr. Zakia, next question. One of the viewers wants to know Will the zakat of a person be accepted if he gives it to an ineligible person by mistake? 
If a person gives zakat to an ineligible person by mistake, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah says in the Quran, He does not catch the servants of Allah if they err and if they forget. So by mistake then inshallah it will be forgiven. And there's a hadith mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, one number two, in the book of Zakat, hadith number 1421, that once a person went out to give alms, and he unknowingly gave the alms to a thief. Next day, the people started speaking that he gave alms to a thief. So he said, oh, praise be to Allah, I will give charity again. So again goes out, and unknowingly, he gives charity to an adulteress. So next day again, people start talking. Oh, he gives charity to an adulteress. So he says, oh, praise be to Allah, I will give charity again. So unknowingly, the third time, when he goes out to give charity, he gives it to a rich person. Again, people start talking. Oh, he has given charity to a rich person. He says, oh, praise be to Allah. And he is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he made a mistake. So there's a person who comes and tells him that, inshallah, charity will be accepted. You may never know you gave charity to a thief, to an adulteress, and to a rich person. You may never know your charity may prevent the thief from robbing. And he may come on the straight path. You may never know, the charity you have given to an adulteress, she may stop doing adultery. She may stop doing sexual intercourse and may come on the straight path. You may never know, the charity you gave to the rich person may kindle in the heart of the rich person that he will spend his wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, based on this hadith, that the niyyah was good. So if a person makes a mistake and he gives zakat to a person who is not eligible, as long as he tried his best to find out the truth, if he makes a mistake, Allah, inshallah, will accept his zakat. But if he's in doubt, he should make an inquiry. But by mistake, if he gives, then inshallah, Allah will not hold him responsible and his zakat will be accepted. Excellent. Thank you. And the last question today, Dr. Zakir, on the topic zakat is, what is the difference between sadaqah and zakat? By definition, zakat, means to purify, to increase, it means goodness, it means blessing. And sadka comes from the root word sitk, which means sincerity. So it is the sincerity and faith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zakat by definition according to Islamic Sharia is an obligatory charity, which every Muslim who owns more than the nisab level or surplus wealth, if he has it with him for a year's period, he has to give 2.5% on it every year. As far as Satka is concerned, it is an optional charity. Zakat is also worship of Allah, obeying the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Satka is also worship of Allah, it's obeying Allah, but it is voluntary. The major difference between Zakat and Satka is that there are certain conditions required. For Zakat, number one, it is given on certain goods. For example, gold, silver, ornaments containing gold or silver, merchandise, it can be business activities, farm produce, cattle, and all the categories. Whereas satka, you don't have to possess any wealth that you have to give satka. It can be just given satka. Point number two, in zakat, these properties and surplus wealth should be with you for one full year, then you have to give zakat. Satka, there is no necessity of any particular wealth being with you for such and such a period. You can just give it without any time period. Point number three, you should have a nisab level of these wealth. Only when you achieve nisab level. For example, if you have gold weighing 85 grams, then you have to give zakat. Or silver, 595 grams. If it's less than that, no zakat is there. Satka, irrespective of the property you have, less, more, irrespective, you can give voluntary. The other difference is this, Zakat can only be given to the eight categories who are permitted to receive Zakat in the Quran. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60, the poor people, the needy, etc., which we discussed earlier. Satka, it can be given to anyone. It can be given to the categories of Zakat, it can be given to the categories outside Zakat. There is no limitation, no binding whatsoever. Point number five. If a person who is liable to pay Zakat, and does not pay zakat and he dies, 
then his children his heir have to see to it that the zakat is paid off if it's from his property before distributing the wealth it should be paid off that's a liability which is not the case of sadqa person who intends to do sadqa and dies his heir need not fulfill that it is his own intention if they want they can it's optional number 6 if you don't give zakat which is the pillar of islam obligation it's compulsory you'll be punished for that and allah says in surah tauba chapter 9 verse number 34 35 you'll be branded with the fire from hell with that gold on which you haven't paid zakat which is not the case in sadqa point number 7 zakat cannot be given to the descendants of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is not the case with sadqa you can give it to the prophet also and to his family Point number eight: You cannot give zakat to the dependents. A father can't give to the son. A person can't give to his father. Whereas sadka, a father can give to his son. A son can give to the father, irrespective of the dependent or not. Point number nine: Zakat in most categories cannot be given to the rich and the healthy. Well, sadka can be given to the rich and the healthy. Zakat cannot be given to the non-Muslims. the sadqa can be given to muslims so these are the major third indifferences between zakat and sadqa well thank you very much dr zakia that sums it up for today and that really does uh, help everybody to know exactly what zakat is who can accept it and of course what it is how it's calculated etc according to the authentic traditions of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine guidance the holy Quran sent to the whole of mankind jazakallah khair jazakallah khair well brothers and sisters yes again we come to the end of another show and today of course we've covered what we believe to be the most important questions that you have posed via email and other methods by post etc and we hope and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have benefited enormously from watching the show and listening to the answers of Dr. Zakia Naik today in our program Ramadan a date with Dr. Zakia I have been your host Yusuf Chambers and tomorrow when we will endeavor to discuss a very very important issue and that is Laila Tal Qadar so do join us again tomorrow at the same time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh